Danny, it's a total delight to have you on stage. Um, uh, I can't imagine a better person to assume leadership of Oxfam at this particular moment, both given your history, your, your, your many, many accomplishments. So let's get right to it. Tell us a little bit about both your past professionally and personally that you think has placed you on this journey to where you are today. Well, I suppose, you know, Oxfam at its heart has been concerned about poverty and um, issues like conflict and displacement. And for me, um, that's been part of my life. I grew up on a little island off the coast of Sri Lanka with my grandparents. We didn't have running water. We didn't have electricity. Um, and it's, you know, Sri Lanka is, a, is an amazing place, but it went through a brutal 30-year civil war. And because of that war, we ended up, in, I ended up living in places like Papua New Guinea, uh, settled in Australia. And so for me, uh, the mission of Oxfam is so close to my heart and is part of my lived experience. And you know, here I am, you know, I've lived in five countries in four continents. I'm happy to have settled in the world's best city here in, uh, where, where, you know, I'm, it's, um, but despite, you know, living here in such comfort in relative terms, I think I'm, I'm still motivated, as are all of my colleagues in Oxfam and many other organizations, by the injustice of, of the fact that we still have abject poverty on the planet, that despite all of this wealth and affluence, there are still hundreds and hundreds of millions of people around the world who, because of disease, disaster, displacement, uh, are not living anywhere near a decent life. And I think that's what motivates me. The, I suppose from a professional point of view, I've only really, I mean, ever since I finished my PhD, only really worked in nonprofits in, in civil society. And I think there's something very special about civic life and civil society organizations. And especially at, in this moment in history where it feels like governments are failing us, that state institutions aren't delivering the just, sustainable world that we need so desperately, and markets are also showing that, you know, left to themselves, they're not going to deliver that. And I think this is the moment in human history where we once again need strong civic formations, where people, ordinary people come together to, f to take action, to speak out, to mobilize, to organize. And for me, it's, you know, Oxfam has, is 76 years old now, but at its essence, it's still about that, that this idea that we as citizens in some cases have to take action and have our own right. If there is still poverty out there, if there are humanitarian emergencies out there, or even if there are policy failures happening here and we have to hold governments to account, I think it's really important that we, we step up to those challenges. So before we delve into the intricacies of what it is to run and manage Oxfam in 2019, give us a little bit of a sense of um, how you see the challenges facing civil society organizations generally and humanitarian organizations specifically. Well, look, I, I, my last job was at a, a network called Civicus, which is a global platform to represent civil society. And I started that job naively, thinking that this was the, the century of the citizen. This was the era in which we as citizens, empowered by new tools, by new techniques, uh, by the internet, would be taking action and be free to go about shaping better societies. But unfortunately, things are going backwards. You know, colleagues at Civicus have shown that in over 100 countries now, civic space, the space in which we as citizens can organize, come together, uh, is shrinking. In over 100 countries, there are one or more uh, civic freedoms under serious threat. So just at a time when we need a strong, vibrant civil society, we're seeing a regression. And even in countries like this, where policymakers are, are telling people who work in, in charities or nonprofits like ours to, um, to sort of apply Band-Aid solutions, deliver good, good things, but don't speak out. Don't speak out, speak up, uh, don't speak truth to power. And I think there is a, a real urgent need to come back to the, how important those civic freedoms are. And then when it comes to you know, the humanitarian world, there is so much unmet need. Um, at Oxfam, Oxfam in Great Britain uh, gets about 400 million pounds of income. I mean, that's amazing. This is one of the most generous societies on the planet, and organizations like Oxfam are epitomized to me, you know, not just the best of British values, but the best of human values. 
But on the other hand, when I see the scale of need out there, you know, there are more people displaced today than there were during World War II. Um, and there are also protracted crises. Um, you know, it's almost two years since the Rohingya population uh, left Myanmar. And it's so difficult to get attention in a really crowded media and social media space for these urgent situations where people are dying, people are suffering. And so I think that's, that's the landscape on which organizations like Oxfam operate and why I think they're so, it's so important that they're strong. So Oxfam's had this storied legacy. It's an extraordinarily important part of the, the global civil society infrastructure. It's also had challenges in, in recent years. Tell us a little bit about its assets, what you hope to build on, and what you hope to change. So I think the, the most important asset in some ways is its, is its founding ethos. Um, I don't know how many of you will know it, but uh, Oxfam was started by eight ordinary people who came together in the basement of a church in Oxford. That's what was first called the Oxford Committee for Famine Relief. It was 1942, um, and p these people were concerned about a famine in Greece, and people were dying because allied forces, allied governments were blockading Greece, Nazi-occupied Greece. And so they set about doing two things, two really important things. They raised money to give uh, money to the Greek Red Cross to provide food relief. But then they set about campaigning uh, to change the British government's policy of, of blockading countries like Greece. And you know, for all of these years, that's been the, the sort of golden threat that's run through, through Oxfam. And I think uh, my job as, a, as an incoming leader is to go back to those founding principles because I think we need those. We definitely need you know, urgent action to save lives, to end poverty, but applying Band-Aids isn't enough. We know that. We have to have the systemic change that delivers a more just, sustainable world. Um, but as you say, you know, it's been a a rough period for Oxfam. Some of you may have seen that in the last year in particular there have been revelations about abuses of power that took place within Oxfam where uh, men in particular uh, were seen to have uh, abused their power and we let our supporters down, we let, us, let ourselves down, but most importantly we let down the communities that we are there to serve. And my job I think is to do two things at least. One is to make sure that we do put our house in order when it comes to safeguarding, to make sure that we've got the systems and practices that uh, we can be truly proud of. But perhaps more importantly, there's a wider cultural question, which is, you know, just because we're saving lives, that doesn't give us an excuse to damage lives in the process. And I think that's a lesson that many institutions are learning throughout society, that the how matters as much as the what. And I think across civil society, across the humanitarian sector, perhaps we've lost sight of that. And what I hope for is a strong, resilient Oxfam that does make a huge dent on the things that matter in the world, but also walks the talk, leads by example when it comes to the things we care most about. And, and, we, that, and we embody the sort of organizational values that um, we espouse and we hold others to account on. So as you and I have spoken about what Oxfam does, I certainly have, and perhaps even you as a new incoming leader, have stumbled on these unexpected, surprising things that Oxfam does that perhaps people wouldn't know about. Um, tell us a few of those. So it's only been four months, and in these four months I've been at Oxfam, I keep discovering these amazing things. For example, you know, we, many of you will know that we have a, a huge network, 600 or so shops around the high street in the UK. Um, and you know, we were the first charity to have a, a shop network like this, and we've got one of the largest in the world. But no item of clothing that I hope many of you donate to Oxfam goes to landfill. And that's because since 1974, we've had a, a recycling plant. And I had the privilege of going to it earlier this week. It's, in, it's a huge 6,000 square meter facility in Yorkshire where we process something like 12,000 tons of donated clothing and sort them out. Some of them will go back to sell here in shops. Some of them will go to festivals like Glastonbury where they're sold. Some of them will go to our uh, trading subsidiary in Senegal to be distributed through Social Enterprise Network. Some of them will have their fibers uh, re-engineered uh, re to be remade into new clothing. And some of them will get sold on the online shop. And uh, I'm proud to say that this 
jacket. This very jacket was picked up at a bargain, 15.99. Very uh, elegant. And, and I'm closer to Danny. It's elegant. <laughs> the, uh, no one's looking, but there is a missing button. Uh, it's, people around the world are going to be dropping buttons as a result note. of... <laughs> I, I don't think uh, Oxfam Chief Executive is necessarily the, the most obvious style icon. But, <laughs> um, but then uh, I think my six-year-old son is here somewhere, and so he'll like me talking about poo and we. Um, Go ahead. Yep. Oxfam, I am happy to say, seems to be expert at poo and we. We are, I think a colleague of mine says, we're plumbers without borders. And so for all of these 70-odd years, We've been at the forefront of delivering water and sanitation in some of the most difficult contexts in the world. I saw it in, in the Democratic Republic of Congo just a few weeks ago where you know, we are there responding to cholera and now Ebola. But you know, we've done, oh, colleagues at Oxfam, I can't take credit for it, have done these amazing things. They've, um, they've developed a tiger worm loo where uh, tiger worms, these particularly aggressive, greedy worms, uh, eat through human excrement uh, and convert it into, into material that can be used as fertilizer. We've got pea-powered urinals in refugee camps around the world where men pee into, their urine, into these urinals and that, the through a chemical conversion um, process, uh, powers the lights that make sure that those bits of the refugee camps are safe for people to walk out at night. And that's you know, amazing humanitarian innovation that I hadn't expected, um, that I'm, you know, I'm happy to take credit for on stages like these. <laughs> um, we live in a time in which we desperately le need effective leaders. And I think one of the great curses of our time is at a time that we need leaders most, they seem to be in such short supply. Um, and so, You've been a leader in almost everything that you've done, and you're assuming responsibility for an organization that you have to lead. So um, tell us a little bit about your approach to leadership, the principles that you think uh, you need to both act and embody, and, and how you should be governing and running an organization at this scale. I think for one takeaway for me is that those of us who work in civil society I think should stop mimicking some of the worst behaviors of what happens out in other bits of society. You know, I was in a meeting recently where another CEO of a charity said, when I asked him, you know, what are your ambitions? He didn't say to end poverty or to save lives. He said, oh, we're number six at the moment in the UK and I'd like to be in the top three. I thought that's weird. You know, that's sort of, we've got our, our sort of ourselves tied into knots there and we need to think about, you know, how do we collaborate? We need to drop this idea that size matters. Um, or that size, you know, sizes everything, and instead probably adopt, uh, I suppose, what is best described as, as principles of feminist leadership, that we need to think about how to work together more collaboratively. We need to think about how power works within our organizations. You know, um, so many of, the, uh, of, of, traditional, of these traditional organizations end up being too hierarchical. Um, they don't embody the principles of, um, that, that we espouse, and I think, I hope, I hope, that my time in Oxfam can be uh, about making sure that we develop our own structures and styles within, within our organization that li live up to that. And also, when it comes to diversity, you know, so many of these really important you know, national treasure organizations in the UK in particular don't represent the diversity of, of, of the societies in which we operate. And I think we really need to make a concerted effort to make sure that our, our, our organizations represent society. And that doesn't mean just ticking a box and doing quota-based approach. It's about really thinking through how do we tap into that diversity and creativity of everyone and not just assume that because they went to that university or, or have that experience that they're best placed. And I hope, I hope that in my time at Oxfam, uh, we can do that a bit better. Oxfam's work has never been more urgent or, or necessary, and they're extraordinarily lucky to have you as a new leader. Thank you for joining us. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs>